The final book in this week's reading is the book of Zephaniah. Let's take a look at some of the background by way of introduction. Zephaniah was probably a contemporary of Jeremiah, Lehi, Nahum, and possibly Habakkuk. According to J.R. Dumelow, the immediate occasion of his preaching appears to have been the advance of an enemy which threatened Judah and its neighbors with sudden and complete destruction. Evidently, the dreaded foe is not their old masters, the Syrians, nor their allies, the Egyptians, but the barbarous Scythians, who had already disturbed the politics of southwestern Asia. A detachment of these ruthless foes, who worshipped their swords and gloried only in murder and plunder, was evidently already sweeping down the eastern shore of the Mediterranean. The prophet had his text and his audience good reason to listen. The old complacency was shaken. The awakened national conscience found expression on the lips of the royal prophet. Rising above the terror of the move moment, he announced that these pitiless destroyers were Jehovah's instruments of punishment and the catastrophe they threatened that threatened his day of judgment. Uh, C.F. Kyle and F. Delich, two great by biblical scholars of the uh, 19th century pointed out that Zephaniah used the immediate danger to stress the universal nature of God's judgment. Quoting them, Zephaniah's prophecy has a more general character embracing both judgment and salvation in their totality so as to form one complete picture. It, is not, it not only commences with the announcement of a universal judgment upon the whole world, out of which the judgment rises that will fall upon Judah on account of its sins, and upon the world of nations on account of its hostility to the people of Jehovah, but it treats throughout of the great and terrible day of Jehovah, on which the fire of the wrath of God consumes the whole earth. Such a message has meaning for people today as the world prepares for its spiritual and temporal judgments. So just as judgment was coming down upon Israel, Judah, so will judgment and the day of the Lord come upon this world and the wickedness therein. Once Zephaniah's prophecy is dated in the days of Josiah, king of Judah, his ministry lasted until at least the year 639 B.C. The time of the king's ascension are stretched well into the years of the monarch's reign of 31 years. Times must have been turbulent in Judah when Josiah ascended the throne. The book of 2 Kings relates that Josiah's father, Ammon, was slain in his own house by conspiring servants, and that the people of the land in turn slew them and secured the throne for Josiah, then a child of eight. We are also informed that Ammon's reign of two years was evil, like that of his father Manasseh before him. Idolatry thereof went on apace, as did the shedding of blood. The reign of Manasseh and Ammon must have continued to affect adversely the worship and conduct of the Hebrew people during the early years of Josiah's reign. Zephaniah mentions the remnant of Baal still in the land. The Kimmerim of idle priests who probably went about in black, the people who worshipped the hosts of heaven upon the housetops, and those who swore by Jehovah and Malcolm. People may had many people had apostatized or had grown indifferent to the true worship of Jehovah. Chapter 1, verse 6. The nobility affected foreign fashions and clothing in direct violation of the law of Moses, which provided for clothing that was designed to keep the Hebrew people distinct from others. Chapter 1, verse 8. The rich of the day were rapacious, rapacious and cruel. Even the servants filled their master's houses with violence and deceit. Chapter 1, verse 9. Social justice Social injustice and corruption were rampant, chapter 3, 1, 3, and 7. Professional prophets were wanton and treacherous, and priests violated or out, or outrag, outrag, outrag the law when expounding it to their people. Outraged. Zephaniah may well may have lived to see and take part in the religious reforms of Josiah, which commenced after the finding of the book of the law in the temple by Hilkiah the priest. The accounts of these reforms mentioned in 2 Kings 23 indicates that the time of Zephaniah before 621 BC were even worse than we have described. 
Consequently, we can understand and appreciate the vehemence and power with which the prophet denounced Judah. The people, however, seem to have been settled on their lees. That is, they were corrupt, selfish, and indifferent, to such an extent that the message of Zephaniah failed to influence them. They said in their hearts, their, they said in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. They were therefore ready for the promised destruction. Again, you can see in this a type of conditions of the last days, as many are complacent and apathetic today. And the, the violence and the destruction, the immorality that's prevalent today. And so we could say, today, our nations, even the United States, are ready for the promised destruction. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 1, who was Zephaniah? Zephaniah was commissioned by God to warn Judah and encourage her to repent. He was a contemporary of King Josiah, and his ministry probably played an important part in the reform movement of that time. Israel was at a pivotal point between peril and safety. Zephaniah's sweeping prose account of God's judgment upon the wicked and the eventual triumph of his kingdom was the message facilitating Judea needed to hear. The brief genealogy in the verse one traces Zephaniah back to Hezekiah. It is not known whether this individual was the same as the Hezekiah the king, or the other names are not of known individuals. Nothing is known of the life of Zephaniah beyond what can be inferred from his book. Zephaniah chapter 1 Verse 2, verses 2 through 3. The day of Jehovah, a day of judgment for guilty Judah. Beyond his message for Judah, Zephaniah asserts God's right and power to judge the whole earth. That is what is meant by God's wrath or God's anger. When he meets out justice, gives righteous judgment because of the wickedness of people, nations, or individuals. His design in cataloging all the various forms of life was to stress the complete scope of judgment. The reference to the wicked focuses attention on the main issue, sin and its inevitable consequences. This prophecy is in keeping with the dualism so common in the writings of Hebrew prophets. Zephaniah both anticipated Judah's impending disaster and foresaw the final destruction of all the of all, and that should be in the of the last days. Zephaniah, well, again, two one chapter one verse two verse two through three, to chapter two verse three. The great theme of the book, as we have already pointed out, is the terrible day of the Lord. Notice the following expressions indica indicative of this fact. The day of the Lord is at hand, 1-7. The day of the Lord's sacrifice, 1-8. The day of the Lord is near, 1-14. The day is a day of wrath, trouble, distress, wasteness, and, dis and desolation, etc., 1-15. He will make an end, yea, a terrible end, 1-18. The day when one passeth as the chaff, 2-2. The day that I rise up to testify, 3-8 all testifying to the fact that mercy cannot and will not rob justice. As Alma 42, 45 says, What do you suppose that mercy can rob justice? I say unto you, nay, not one whit. If so, God would cease to be God. Thus explain that God's anger or wrath, etc., is the way of saying if one chooses to not repent and receive mercy, then God's justice will occur. Whenever it says God's anger in Scripture, it just means God's righteous use of justice. His, the day of the Lord has come. People have made their choice. Some have used their agency poorly, and they now must face the punishment that comes upon those who choose not to repent. That's all it means by God's anger. Not our kind of anger. Not even close to that. Thank goodness. And God does not delight in that. He's not down saying, ooh, look what I get to do to these evil people. And he delights in bringing death and destruction. That would be our warped way of thinking. No, these are his children. But this is what they have chosen. And so they must now meet the consequences. Alma 42, 41 through 24 states, And if there was no law given, if men sinned, that could, what could justice do? or mercy either, for they would have no claim upon the creature. 
But there is a law given, and a punishment affixed, and a repentance granted, which repentance mercy claimeth. Otherwise, justice claimeth the creature, and executeth the law, and the law inflicteth the punishment. If not so, the works of justice would be destroyed, and God would cease to be God. But God ceaseth not to be God, a mercy claimeth the penitent. A mercy cometh because of the atonement, and the atonement bringeth to pass the resurrection of the dead, and the resurrection of the dead bringeth bringeth back men into the presence of God, and thus they are restored into his presence to be judged according to the works, according to the law and justice. For behold, justice exerciseth all his demands, and also mercy claimeth all which is her own, and thus by none but the truly penitent are saved. If you want mercy... It is based upon the conditions of repentance. Mercy, I repeat, mercy is not unconditional. There are too many, one in the world, who believe that, and too many in this church who think that. Oh, God loves you so much. He will approve of my behavior. My adulteries, my fornications, whether they're heterosexual or homosexual, it doesn't matter. No. If you want mercy, you must repent, or justice claimeth her own. Therefore, God's anger, wrath, etc., is the righteous use of justice, because people chose not to use repentance and receive mercy. Zephaniah 1, 2, through chapter 2, 3. Continuing. Let the reader keep in mind that Zephaniah's fundamental concept of the day of the Lord is essentially the same as that of Joel, Obadiah, and Malachi. They all understand well that the term referred to the second advent of the Lord in the latter days, with his accompanying scene of judgment and desolation. Zephaniah's use of the theme of the day of the Lord was brought about by the wickedness of the people of Judah. Their crimes and excesses merited a stern and vigorous rebuke. Knowing the great judgments and desolations that were to descend upon the world in the latter days at the Lord's second advent, or his coming, Zephaniah determined to bring home to his people the awful retribution that should shortly befall them in terms descriptive of that great but future event in world history. Zephaniah's prophecy is a great revelation of the future, designed to impress the people of his own and future times with the fact that crime, wickedness, and religious indifference cannot be forever condoned by a patient and merciful God. There does come a time when time runs out, and you cannot repent anymore. You must face the consequences. And Zephaniah is saying that's what's going to happen to Judah, using that as also saying the last days that will happen to. That which men sow, they must inevitably reap. For that reason, the book of Zephaniah is another prophetic warning to our own generation. What happened then will happen in the last days. The prophecy of Zephaniah begins by announcing great judgments upon the world and Judah. Exaggerated figures are purposely used to bring home to men the terrible nature of God's judgments in the great day of the Lord. In verses 2 through 18, Jehovah says eight things he will do using the phrase, I will, will I, or in or at that day. Let's take a look what those eight things he says will happen because they will not repent. Number one, chapter one, verse two, he will completely destroy all things from off the face of the land. We know that to be true also from the Doctrine and Covenants. Number two, chapter one, verse three, he will also consume fowls, fishes, and the stumbling blocks, meaning the idols, with the wicked. Those things they used that they stumbled with that took their attention away from Jehovah. That will all be destroyed. 
as it says in Doctrine and Covenants 101, 22-25, Behold, it is my will that all they who call upon my name and worship me according to my everlasting gospel should gather together and stand in, my, in holy places and prepare for the revelation which is to come. When the veil of the covering of my temple and my tabernacle, which hideth the earth, shall be taken off, and all flesh shall see me together, in reference to his second advent or coming. And every corruptible thing, both of men and of beasts of field, or the fowls of the heavens, or the fishes of the sea, that dwell upon all the face of the earth, shall be consumed. And also that of element shall melt with fervent heat, and all things shall become new, that my knowledge and glory may dwell upon all the earth. God will completely destroy the wickedness and wicked elements and the natural things upon the earth. So this earth will go from a telestial, a mortal sphere, to a terrestrial, an immortal sphere. It will change to a new heaven and new earth. Therefore, everything that is telestial in nature must be destroyed. People, whatever. Beings, things, all of it. Number three, chapter one, verses four through six. He will cut off from the land all traces of Baalism, together with the cherim, the black-robed priests of Baal, as well as the wicked priests of Jehovah who degraded his worship. The sweeping judgment and reformation will also afflict, affect those who follow the example of their Assyrian masters and worship the stars upon the housetops, those who bow down before the moon, and those who swear fealty to the Ammonite god Milcom, and all those apostates who have ceased to worship Jehovah. Today, that would be all those who worship the false gods of pornography, all the false gods of sexual immorality, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual, it doesn't matter, all those who worship the false gods of materialism, and the like. Number four, chapter one, verses seven through eight. He will prepare a day for a sacrifice of the wicked, the punishing of the princes, the king's children, and all who array in foreign apparel, or meaning go after foreign customs. Mormon 8, 35-39 seems to speak of this same exact thing among the Lamanites and Nephites. Behold, they speak unto you as if you were present, and ye are not. But behold, Jesus Christ has shown you unto me, and I know your doings. And I know that ye do walk in the pride of your hearts. And there are none save a few only who do not lift themselves up in the pride of their hearts. Uh, probably even had a parade to celebrate it. Back to the quote. Unto the wearing of very fine apparel. Unto envy and strife and malice and persecution and all manner of iniquities. He's not against fine looking good. He's against what those things lead to and the arrogance and the pride they cause. Back to the quote. And your clothes, yea, even every one, have become polluted. Your churches, I'm sorry, yea, every one have become polluted because of the pride of your hearts. For behold, you do love money and your substance and your fine apparel and the adorning of your churches more than you love the poor and the needy, the sick and the afflicted. O ye pollutions, ye hypocrites, ye teachers, who sell yourselves for that which will canker, why have you polluted the holy church of God? Why are you ashamed to take upon you the name of Christ? Remember, he's talking to members of the church and the true church here they have polluted. He's not talking about other religions. Why do you think not think that greater is the value of an endless happiness than the misery which never dies because of the praise of the world? Why do you adorn yourselves with that which hath no life? And yet suffer the hungry, the needy, the naked, the sick, and the afflicted to pass by you, and notice them not. That's what is meant by chapter 1, verses 7 through 8. Arrayed in foreign apparel, foreign custom, the things of the world, the ways of the world, the fashions of the world, the fine apparel, the love of the world, and the money, all of that. Mormon describes it well. Number five, chapter one, verse nine, he will punish those leap on the threshold, meaning those who plunder and pillage, see footnote 9a in the Bible, homes by acts of oppression and injustice to fill their master's houses. 
Number six, chapter one, verses 10 through 11. In that day, the fish gate was on the north end of the city. People there would be the first to see an enemy invading from the north. The fish gate opened into part of the city known as the second quarter, verse 10, probably because it was an expansion of the original city of David. This quarter would be the first reached from the north, causing them to howl. Mactesh, verse 11, was the name of the merchant quarter, which lay in the second quarter. Thus, the reference to merchants, they that beat silver, will be cut down and cut off. So in that day, those who are in that quarter, those who are merchants, those who lusted after things of material things, will be cut down and will be destroyed. That's what he's saying. Number seven, chapter one, verse 12. At that time, Jehovah will search Jerusalem with candles, meaning thoroughly, as was required in the poorly lighted houses of Palestine. Everyone will be searched, so to speak, by God. And if you're found wanting in righteousness, you will not be spared. Settled upon their lees, in verse 12, is a figure drawn from winemaking. The lees are the thick residue of the pulp of the grapes. Good wine, when it remains for a long time upon its lees, becomes stronger. But bad wine becomes harsher and thicker. The interpretation of the symbol is that wicked men, like bad wine, remain apathetic about the true religion and become increasingly harsher and bitter, as we see today. And... Chapter 1, verses 13 through 16, this should be number 8. Therefore, or was there 7? Therefore, the men who think God is indifferent to their actions shall lose their wealth. Those who are apathetic, those who are indifferent, oh, God will do ah, who cares about God? Their homes and vineyards shall avail them nothing, causing the mighty men to cry bitterly. It will be a day of wrath, trouble, distress, waste. Wasteness, desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, when the alarm shall be sound to warn the pending doom. Then number 8, chapter 1, verses 17 through 18. He will bring distress upon the people who will stagger as if drunk because they have sinned against the Lord, with their blood being poured out as dust and their flesh as dung. Their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them from the wrath of God. In the day of the Lord's wrath and in the fire of his zeal, the whole earth will be consumed. Brothers and sisters, your job, your, your popularity, your money, your material things, that kind of success, none of that will save us in the great day of the Lord. Whether you're here or in the spirit world, the wicked in the spirit world are just as fearful as those in the world here when Christ comes. You can't get out of this thing. Now, exhortation to repentance, he gives them. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. In doing the will and winning the favor of God is man's only sure way of escape from all the dangers of life. The Lord's plea is for us to become meek and seek righteousness. That's what he pleads in these verses. Here is your only way out of the terrible and great day of the Lord. Whether it's terrible, terrible or great is up to you and how we use our agency. And it's now he's telling you, use your agency to become meek and righteous. So now what is meek? Elder Alvin A. Dyer gave the following edition of meekness in general conference when he said, I believe there's perhaps a distinction between humility and meekness. It may be said that meekness is a condition of voluntary humility. See, that is significant. Sometimes we become humble because of our circumstances. Maybe a loved one dies or economic conditions become terrible or something. And we turn our heart to the Lord because we're seeking help and we want help. And so we, we become humble because of our circumstances. Well, Elder Dyer is trying to tell us and what Zephaniah is trying to tell us that just choose to be humble. Don't let circumstances dictate the day. Meekness is voluntary humility. I just choose to humbly submit to God's will. Not because of circumstance, not because I need something, not because I'm in dire stress, though in a sense we all are because of the fall, but because I love God. And so I just meekly turn to him. 
and rely upon him. That is the way out of all of this destruction and the only way out. It is to the meek that Jehovah says, It may be ye, the meek, shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. That is, his justice. Zephaniah 2, 3. That's what I want. Meekness, brothers and sisters. Meek and lowly of heart is the escape from the destruction of the wickedness and wicked of the latter days. Zephaniah 2, 14 through 15, the destruction of foreign nations hostile to Judah. Zephaniah's message of world judgment concerns those nations traditionally hostile to Judah. The prophet has already predicted the punishment of his own people, but he knows that the foreign nations who have taunted and reviled them are even more worthy of destruction. So he names them one by one and pronounces God's judgments upon them. The cities of Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, and Ekron, representing the Philistines, are to be forsaken, desolated, rooted up, and destroyed. They shall become meadows and folds for flocks to be inherited by the remnant of Judah when the Lord turns their captivity. One day Israel will be gathered in righteousness and come back. And all the other nations that oppress them, they will now be oppressed. And Israel, mighty Israel, will take its place as the head. And that gathering is taking place in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as we gather up Israel and bring them into the fold, into the church, through mission work and baptism. And then one day a separate body will return as the lost ten tribes to receive their inherited blessings of temple covenants under the hands of Ephraim. And they will join the house of Israel. That is something yet to be seen. Judah was not the only nation ripe for destruction. The foreign peoples who taunted and reviled Judah were even more worthy of annihilation. Each of them would share in the impending doom. Still, there was some hope. Those who see the worst in human nature are often the first to see a gleam of hope. Following the gloom, unmitigated and unre unrevealed in any way, Zephaniah sends one shaft of light into the darkness. A remnant may yet be saved. See verses 2 through 3 in chapter 2. He does not see any way of escape but for any but for the humble, whom he mentions in contrast to the proud who have provoked the right jealous wrath of God. A remnant will one day... That, be saved, and that is the gathering of Israel, the remnant that we are gathering back today. Zephaniah 3, 1 through 7, Jerusalem, the polluted city. Zephaniah turned again to Jerusalem with both warning and promise. He condemned many groups in Judah's society, including the political leaders, the judges, the prophets, and the priests. Corruption was at every level. He stressed the constant righteousness and justice of the Lord, who continually brings down wicked people and nations. All hope was not to be lost, however, because there would still be a remnant with whom God would work and bring to pass his righteous purposes. In addition, there is always God's unbound mercy. The righteous in any age can take comfort in their righteousness. That's who are saved, remember? The meek, those who voluntarily follow the Savior, that is the penitent, those who repent. You can't you know, follow the Savior through repentance because we're fallen. That's who receives mercy. This is a severe arraignment of Zephaniah's own people and is truly prophetic. Israel has special privileges. Hence, responsibilities inevitably follow. A chosen people elects spiritual responsibilities, and when they choose to turn away from God, their doom follows. Zephaniah's warning left no room for misunderstanding, particularly on the part of Israel's leaders. Israel became polluted because she would not obey the voice of Jehovah. It's chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. Her entire leadership from the princes to the priests were corrupt in violation of the law, God's law. Chapter 2. 3, verses 3 through 4. Though Jehovah had been just with Israel all the day long, verse 5, yet she would have to face the consequences of her choices of corruption, chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. 
Only those who are willing to wait upon the Lord and hearken to instruction will not be cut off. Verse 7. Only the penitent and those who turn to Christ and endure to the end in following staying steadfast in him. Zephaniah 3, 8 through 20, Zephaniah's final message. Sidney Beesbury, the great Old Testament scholar, said, In the following verse, chapter 3, verse 8, we have a transition between the denunciation, threats, and warnings that have gone before and the ideal picture which follows. Not only so, but the verse is important as a check to our interpretation of the book. In a word, it is a key. In my interpretation of Zephaniah, I have assumed that the prophet warns Judah and the other nations of near destruction in terms of the great day of the Lord, which was centuries removed from Zephaniah's time, and in fact is still future. In the verse under consideration, that interpretation seems to be borne out. The Lord addresses himself to the righteous, apparently as Zephaniah's own generation, and tells them of the great day in which God will pour out his indignation and fury and fiery anger upon the kingdoms of the earth. To Latter-day Saints, it is clear from the verses immediately following that this judgment is to take place in the present dispensation, since they refer to the gathering of Israel. His prophecies are for our time. That's why they're so significant. Zephaniah, like so many of the prophets, finds it hard indeed to see only the gloomy and evil side of his people. Ideal, idealistically, as he is, he looks also for the good. Not all of Israel are to be destroyed. There will still exist in the centuries to come a righteous remnant with whom God can work and bring to pass his righteous purposes in the earth. Since the prophet has warned his people in terms of the world judgment of the latter days, he considers it only just to hold out to them the rosy and beautiful picture of gathered and redeemed Israel of the same era. If it does not impress the wicked and cause their reform, it will at least comfort the righteous and show them that the lives and work will not have been in vain. Verses 9 through 10. And so it is, you and I are deciding, are we going to be among the righteous who gather with Israel and to the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints through baptism and then later temple covenants and receive mercy? Or are we going to let the judgments of God be poured out upon us through destruction? Because we will not gather with the righteous. It is entirely up to us. Continuing, Brother Sperry, the prophet then shows that the remnant of Israel will be ashamed of their doings, their iniquities, and deceitful ways. As an afflicted and poor people, they shall take refuge in the Lord. Finally, the prophet burst into a pian of song and rejoicing over the redeemed Israel, whose, whose Lord is in the midst of her. That's verses 10 through 14, chapter 3. Zephaniah saw our day and beyond. In it he both suffered and rejoiced. He suffered in spirit because of the desolation and destruction which he saw. But he also was also able to use this as a warning and threat to his own people. And thus, in the redemption and final blessings of Israel, he saw a ray of hope to extend to Judah. No prophet has written more clearly or vigorously of the day of the Lord. Zephaniah must be added to the list of prophets who give us a grave warning of disaster. We have been forewarned. That's why Jehovah put these books in here and why he wants us to study them and why we call them the minor prophets is beyond me. We're doing them a disservice. God has warned us in Zephaniah, I will destroy the wicked and wickedness upon the earth. You've been forewarned. If you want to be spared, then I suggest you gather with Israel. You gather with the righteous remnant who are meek, who voluntarily humble themselves and follow me and come into the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints through baptism and receive their temple covenants and are faithful to them. As Zephaniah started, he ends with five I will concerning Israel and her mission. So just as he started, he now concludes with these. Zephaniah 3, 19 through 20. Behold, at that time, the latter days, the gathering of Israel, the remnant, I will do all that afflict I will undo, I will undo all that afflict thee. 
I will save her that haleth, and gather her that was driven out, and I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. At that time will I bring you again, even the time that I gathered you, for I will make you a name and a praise among all the people of the earth, when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. So Zephaniah also prophesies what he will do, what the great Jehovah I will do for those who are meek and lowly of heart and gather with my people. I will undo their affliction. I will save them. I will make give them praise and fame. I will turn back their captivity. They shall be spared. May we have a, the sense and fortitude to take heed this message and gather unto Christ and be steadfast in him and endure to the end. Israel, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, will be gathered and triumph. That is its future destiny, and it shall come to pass. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button, and please subscribe to the channel.